Hi, Betsy. Thanks so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here on a wonderful Friday afternoon. I think we had a new moon last night, and a lot of new things are possible. Yes, I agree. That's a very good start for the day, isn't it? It's a wonderful start. What new intentions do you have today as far as birding? Um, for myself, when I go for a walk this afternoon and I see that the weather now has changed to a beautiful blue sky day, I'm going to walk with my dog uh, down to uh, Edgewater Park, which is a beautiful public park just about a mile from me along the southern shore of Lake Erie. And I will see what birds I can see, probably water birds and water shore birds. Um, as well as some of, hopefully, some of the migrants that are passing through from the north of us and traveling, stopping for briefly, and then traveling south uh, to um, the southern areas of the state, as well as Central and South America. Well, that's wonderful. I, I wish I could be there, but as you, as you walk with your, with your dog at the beach, my favorite beach in the world, Edgewater, if you could just tell the birds that you see, the migratory birds, that they're welcome here in Georgia. We have a wonderful coastline in Savannah, and as they head further south, you know, towards the Caribbean and South America, they're more than welcome to stop and say hi and bring your blessings with them. Oh, that's awesome. What a nice message. Wonderful. And who, do we, who else do we have on the call today? Hi, my name is Johanna, and I live in Berea. Hi. Hi, Johanna. How are you today? I'm good, and you? Good. And what are your plans for the new moon and birds? Um, well, just to enjoy seeing the ones that I see, no specific plans. <laughs> I already That's took excellent. a two-hour bike ride, so. Ah, beautiful. And your name is very familiar. Have we met before? I met you at the Cleveland Natural Science Club you, somewhere, it was probably 12 or 15 years ago uh, when you came and talked at Lookabout Lodge in the South Chagrin Reservation. Ah. And, and you had a, a boy with you that was, that had been working with you, one of the neighborhood kids at one of your gardens. Um, and had earned a bike. You remember mm -hmm. that, that kid? I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. A, a That's number what I remember most. A number of those youth that I work with back in those days are married or they have children, they have, they have decent jobs, decent job. and they all stayed and local, they all stayed local. And they all have guns. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yep. Wow. Yep. Well, thanks That's for the good memories. Yeah, yeah. So, and I've, I've, I have probably seen you at, at other events, but that's the one that I really remember. Wonderful. I remember driving there and being amazed at the, the structure. I remember being amazed by the sounds of nature all around us, and it was very quiet, so nature was very loud. And yes. For the young man, it was something brand new because we live in an urban environment and he never got out to the woods. That was yeah. a, a big stretch for him. And yeah. I do recall on the way back, he was kind of quiet. And I asked him, you know, what are you thinking about? And he said something like, I never heard something so different in my life. And he was referring to the birds and maybe cicadas and things like that. So, Aww. you know, nature is a wonderful thing. And yeah. I thank you and your team back in the old days for bringing us out to be able to share our content of what we do in our urban environment. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a great talk. Uh, Joanna and I were chatting just a little bit while um, we were working with the technology. And Johanna, if you don't mind, I'd love to hear again, hear again. 
mm -hmm. more about you and what you do and what brought you to our conversation today and how you arrived. You arrived. <laughs> well, literally, I just had the day off, took a long bike ride, and I got home and saw the email that this was coming up, and I just decided to join. Um, I'm, I was intrigued about urban agriculture because I work a lot with the Berea Community Learning Farm, which is our local uh, community garden in Berea, and we're dedicated organic. And I joined the board about a year ago, and um, you know we do a lot with community involvement. Um, this year, the police have a giant plot, and another community group called Boys to Men has a a big plot, and they and the police together have worked to uh, engage teenage boys, and. In the past, well, last year we had a a 4-H teenage group that worked with one family to get a beehive going, and um, you know we just have various projects like that and individual pr uh, plots for people and uh, a huge hoop house where all the production goes to the food bank on a weekly basis, pretty much year-round including maybe one quarter of the fenced um, outside plots goes to the food bank too. Um, and uh, just very grateful to have that where I live. So I want to keep it going. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to do little things to kind of help promote permaculture. Like, for example, I planted a, a long bed of comfrey mm. so people can come and harvest leaves and lay them down um, on their plots to just naturally nourish the soil. And um, just little things like that. That's wonderful. And we have a little cutting garden where people can come, uh, they can plant any flower they want to or they can pick any flower that they want to. And that's like a little no-till project that was just kind of like a lasagna type um, garden with just wood chips and whatever amendments were available. And we have in our parking lot, we have piles of manure and wood chips. We used to have wood um, leaf compost. We don't have any more piles of coffee grounds from the airport. <laughs> so anybody's welcome to use those. So we're very lucky to have those resources. And do you want and do you all save seed? Well, I do. Um, I I think that there there might be a couple other people in my garden that have done some. Um, I try to you know give a bundle to the Cleveland Seed Bank every so often. Not from everything I have, but just a few things that are a little bit easier to save seeds from. Mm -hmm. And do you leave seeds for the birds over the winter as well? Well, see, our garden is a little bit different because it's not a perennial garden. Um, so, you know, they are still in the mode of you know, everyone needs to be out by the end of October and clear their plot, and then it gets filled. I mean, we do put down, um, you know, like either uh, leaf compost or wood chips or manure and, and work that in. Um, but 
you know, like, I, I've never brought up the idea of, you know, could we be a perennial garden, but that's certainly worth exploring. I know a lot of other community gardens are. There's, um, I've, I've only been with it for about three years since I moved to Berea. Okay. Okay. Yeah, there's um, a lot of opportunity for overwintering and adding cover crops that would benefit the wildlife that, you know, passes through both leaving and coming back and also feeding the, the robins and the jays and, you know, the cardinals that stick around forever. And one of the efforts is to look at how we eat as humans year round and also how the animals that are around us eat year round. And working with community gardens and small farms and large farms to dedicate a little bit of space for food crops that aren't normally used as food crops so that the seeds can remain for those critters that remain has been a passion of mine for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. As we have the ability to go shopping somewhere or go to a farmer's market, we should be thinking about nature. And as nature always provides for itself, but when we put our hands in nature and clear a spot, we have to also think about we're just taking care of ourselves in the meantime by putting down a cover crop, but are we taking care of nature at the same time? And if I can be of help to be an advocate, if that's something that you think the, the group would want, just, just let me know, and we can talk about the simplicity of it, also the soil building capacity of it, and mm -hmm. the capacity to feed nature over the winter. So mm -hmm. that when nature passes through, there's something there. And when nature comes back up from the south, there's something there. And all those simple things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because a lot of people have, you know, um, talked about, you know, could we have a little pollinator garden with milkweed? But, you know... I think people are worried about it spreading to all the plots. Um, so we we haven't done that um, because you know I think they're worried that it would then kind of be everywhere. But you know I know that's not the only thing you can plant. Yeah. Uh, milkweed is a tremendous crop for a number of creatures, not just the monarch. And having it uh, available is a good thing, I feel, because it's a food source. And it's a mm -hmm. unique food source. And I think that if we mulch properly, it's not going to spread everywhere. If you don't have mulch down, it's, it has that potential to, you know, spread. So putting mulch down or a heavy cover crop like clover that will be there year-round for you will prevent the milkweed from spreading everywhere and can just be isolated in the milkweed cutting butterfly garden. So the, the clover, um, I know it's possible to plant that, but what did you mean by year-round? Clover, white clover, is the type of clover that can stay in most every environment except for like maybe a zone 9 or 10. And that clover is able to put nitrogen into the ground and it's also good for the pollinators. And there are some birds that would come and feed on the pollinators as the clover is in flower. So you're feeding the ground, you're feeding pollinators, and you're feeding birds. That clover grows to be so thick in a good way 
that the weed would not be able to come through. So you're adding a protective layer that you would not have to weed because the clover would be there. And clover is also edible and in some cultures is used as a medicine. Mm -hmm. But but what about during the, the growing season when people, you know, need the soil bare to cultivate though? Okay. Here's a here's the interesting tidbit. You can just dig your little five inch hole and put your tomato right in that five inch hole where the clover was. Take a five inch diameter hole, take out the clover, plant your tomato, your pepper, your cucumber, and that ground cover the clover stays right there. And it continues to capture nitrogen. And it continues to feed the pollinators, which you need for your cucumbers, your squash, your tomatoes, and on and on and on. Hmm. So because we don't plant every square inch, because we have to leave X amount of, you know, space between each plant, why not have something already down there that's a natural living mulch? Mm -hmm. hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, give it, give it some thought. Um, yeah. a, a lot of people in the permaculture business call it a living mulch. So as you're leaning towards permaculture, think about living mulches, things you don't have to put down dead to create better soil, but things that can be alive that suck in lots of, you know, bad things and keep them for us, sequestered, as it were. Yeah. Very cool. Let's talk birds. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> I love birds. Ah, Betsy, what's your favorite bird? Ah, uh, let's see. Um, oh gosh, that's such a difficult question. There are so many that are so fascinating. And when you think about, like the, uh, you know, any of the falcons or the eagles, any of the raptors or the predator. Um, birds, they're just so amazing. I can't believe that, you know, in their their design of architecture and bodily infrastructure, how they're so super, super designed to um, for speed, accuracy, and um, uh, and you know sustainability. It's just amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. There must be plants that are as well designed, obviously, um, to survive as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and Johanna, what are your favorite birds? Um, well, I hate to be so <laughs> uh, common, but I just absolutely love cardinals. So. Oh, yeah. Cardinals are great. They're, they're yeah. beautiful, and that and that song they have is so simple. <laughs> Such a yep. simple song. Wow. Yeah. I like how the cardinals always follow each other. You know, they're they're always within ten feet of each other, usually. The pairs. Yeah, there's one that goes between my roof and a next door tree across the street, and they just go back and forth, back and forth. That's nice. Um, Johanna, I want to ask you, you had mentioned that you, you um, in your networks are youth. Um, and I just want to say that as part of the class that Maurice is engaged in with us, um, he asked at the very outset that um, uh, youth be um, integrated. So it's certainly, you know, an intergenerational body of students is to participate in the class. Um, and um, there's also in there, uh, we're uh, working on fundraising to, uh, um, to offer up eight student scholarships. And not only that, um, to support each student speech or participation in the class, but we're also, we've also developed a beautiful field bag uh, for students, or in this case, for the students, uh, the student scholarship students, um, that includes a sort of um, 
a really fun, uh, uh, you know, a, a field bag that contains a urban birding Cleveland t-shirt and binoculars and a journal and a sketch pad, colored drawing pencils, uh, you know, a bird identification book, all kinds of great things. So maybe if you don't mind, maybe I can send some of that information to you. I'd appreciate any feedback or and or if you're able to pass it along to others. Yeah, that would be wonderful. I will I'll pass it along to Chris Scott, who is the founder of Voice to Men in Berea. Oh, that would be awesome. Now, yeah. I, I know, Maurice, if I may interject here, um, uh, we've been talking also with Esperanza um, uh, here in Cleveland, and we'd also like looking for and to engage other um, youth and intergenerational organizations to help uh, youth students participate, uh, hopefully and possibly, if Maurice can do it uh, with his time uh, next summer for an uh, eight-week uh, summer session. So that, that might be of interest, too. So we're, we're working hard trying to create a lot of different opportunities to, to be able to uh, know, get to know Maurice and um, be exposed to the, this wonderful conversation and uh, to be guided by him to do activities and work over time. That has my support. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes. Where are they located at Esperanza? Esperanza is um, an organization that um, is a nonprofit organization that's based here in the, I, I'm quite certain that they um, uh, um, provide service to the greater Cleveland area, but I can send you some more information about it as well. Okay. Um, but the, um, the uh, did you say the group is boys? Boys, what what was the name of that group? Boys to Men, and I think it's B O Y S, then the number two M E N. Okay. And uh, Chris Scott is the leader of that group. Okay, great. And I don't have his like a phone or email, but I do have him on Facebook, so okay. I can. Whatever you send me, sure. Um, somehow, or I could ask him for his email through Facebook. Yeah, yeah, no problem. That would be very helpful. Like I yeah. said, we're you know we'd like to knit together anyone who's interested, as far as organizations go, to um, help be leaders, um, to form a small community, uh, to connect. Um, you know, the people that they, they care about to classes with Maurice. So, yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, and, and certainly sponsoring organizations too. We just want to want to be able to, to uh, create lots of different offerings with Maurice um, as his time permits uh, and to offer them to, to uh, um, all generations. Maurice, could you talk about that class just a little bit, um, ab about uh, some of the highlights of it? Sure thing. As we, as we wrap up today's conversation, yes. the benefit of, of the class to everyone, and Betsy, you mentioned the intergenerational aspect of it. I would like, I would like us all to think about what we have around us and our assets and looking at who we are as people in nature, no matter the most urban dense environment of New York or Chicago or San Francisco, we still have nature. And as you know, those cities that I mentioned, Chicago being on Lake Michigan, New York being on the East Coast with the Atlantic there, and San Francisco being on the Pacific, there are a number of wonderful birds that are all around us. If you go to Coney Island, you're going to see different types of birds. And if you go to Coney Island in the rain, when there's no people, 
you'll see more different types of shorebirds that are showing up. If you go to San Francisco, of course you can go to the, the wharf and you can go to different parts of uh, the inner areas around the bridges and you're going to see those shorebirds again but from a different species and different variety. In Chicago, up where you all are at, with Lake Michigan, Lake Erie, all the Great Lakes, you're going to find a wonderful variety of shorebirds that are just right there waiting for their next meal of frogs and tadpoles and all those little minnows and things like that. I'm speaking of the, uh, the herons and the egrets and all those wonderful shorebirds that we have around us in the most dense environment. So being able to appreciate the birds that are there, no matter where we are, if you live in Iowa and you take the class and you're living in Iowa or you're living in Kansas or Manitoba, no matter where you are, you will be able to explore what's around you and be able begin to appreciate what these birds have to offer. At the same time, we can begin to appreciate the ecosystem that we're living in with these birds, shorebirds, forest birds, woodland birds, plains birds. All these birds are vital to who we are. There's that, there's that old saying of the canary in the cage and how that canary in the, in the mines, they would keep an eye on it. <laughs> if it didn't sing or it suddenly passed out, there was something amiss. As we know, we have something amiss all over the world with numerous species of birds passing away suddenly, and we don't have an explanation for it. I believe it was uh, this past Monday or Tuesday, there was a number of um, birds that passed away in New Mexico. And the... The bird people out there have begun to do autopsies on the birds to find out what was happening. And some say it was the rapid climate change up north in Colorado, that area, and the birds were flying south, but they hadn't put on enough fat to make it. As a result, are we feeding our birds? Are we leaving enough seeds for our birds? Are we leaving enough uh, insects for our birds? Or are our birds being killed because we are killing our insects, which the birds eat. So the whole purpose of the class is to really look at who we are as people, where we live, how we live, and how we're able to impact nature. Because of the vehicles that we drive and ride around in, because of our carbon footprint, I would like to share the simpleness of working with nature with the situations that we currently have, which are heavy on carbon, heavy on oil. And I would like to talk about individualism as far as someone in Manitoba and someone in Jamaica and someone in Oregon and then someone in Peru. We have the capacity because of these phones and technology to be able to communicate very easily, very readily. Oftentimes, our communication is very quick and short. This class, I want us to be able to explore each other and the different time zones and migratory zones that we have shared with the birds and the other wildlife that we have around us. So that's, uh, and of course, there'll be details about urban food for us, but I want to interweave everything into what is the environment for the birds, what is the environment for us, what is the environment for the pollinators? And how do we protect and mix all of these things together to make it stronger for nature? Because we're a part of it, and we have that responsibility as humans to protect it, preserve it, and make sure that it lasts as long as possible, not only for us, but our children and our grandchildren and our great-great-grandchildren and on and on. Oh, thank you, Maurice. That's a beautiful description. Joanna, don't you agree? Absolutely. Yes. Well, well, thank you so much. Um, does, do, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add? 
Joanna, we're happy that we caught you this morning and happy that you happened to see your notice <laughs> and jumped right on, and that's exactly how this works. Yeah. So we'll, little bit by little bit, we begin to build uh, the, the, um, our important relationships and our, our social networks so that we can help each other and, and, and uh, do, do good things for people, birds, and wildlife. So, Amen. Um, yeah, very good. Maurice, thank you so much for your time this morning and today. Um, I wish everyone a great afternoon and a lovely weekend. You too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.